Would you turn with me to Luke chapter 1 and verse 26? We looked at um, Thursday night, part 1, and we dealt with a verse I've always wanted to deal with by the predetermined counsel of the foreknowledge of God. Speaking of the love of God, that before the foundations of the earth, God died for my sins, and that God chose me and God loved me. And it shows how God had a plan and God had a purpose and the church was part of that purpose. And so that's why we can really love what God's doing here. It's really God's will. And no matter what you do to a church or what a pastor does to it, when it's all said and done, he'll find another pastor and build it once again. Because the church is instituted by God. And that as a home, as a government, so on. God is going to take responsibility. So when I look at this, I begin to think, you know, I need to start the series here. So it's kind of like you look at the end of the movie, and then all of a sudden you start the very beginning. So we looked at Thursday night from the foundations of the earth. Well, now we come to Mary, and we see here that she was gifted. She was blessed. We believe that she was about 14, if not 13 years old, very young, and the question is, what do girls do back then? No doubt she had to work. There was no toys or anything else. She didn't have a bunch of shopping to do. There were no Rosses back in those days, no black cells. I mean, they didn't have anything. They had one pair of clothes, and that was about it. And so I imagine they played with things and did things and kept themselves busy. But one day, God did something very unique. He surprised her. And I think the real heart of the whole message is that God wants to surprise you. That God has something for you, a very, very special thing. And I think when you lose that, when you all of a sudden become so cynical and so critical, that no longer can you be surprised. No longer do you really care. That's a sad day. I think that God can change a wife. I think God can change a husband. I think God can change a child. I think that God can show you some great things in and through your life that it becomes a surprise what God does. And that's what he does best. He takes ordinary people he makes them extraordinary. Why would he do that? Because he has something very special he wants to do. And you have been chosen by God to do that work. So if I try to do it in my own strength, it's no good. But there are times I'm going to go through difficult times. But I'll tell you what, you're going to minister so much more wiser, so much more with authority. And so here, it's kind of interesting from the Old Testament to the New Testament, 400 years of silence does nothing. No prophets, nothing going on. Kings were lousy, everything else was going bad. And then one day, out of nowhere, all of a sudden, we find the shepherds are just blown away. They're having a little cup of coffee, talking, the heavens are lit up. It's a day they will never forget. And the glory of God was seen. And the calling of God was upon their life. And they had to go. And the reason why was no one else was going to go see Jesus. Isn't that sad? In other words, everyone was too busy. It wasn't that they were sinning, but the innkeeper was just preoccupied, busy doing this or busy putting up the lights or busy doing all these things, and they don't want to get to church. They don't want to do spiritual things. They're preoccupied. Well, look at what happened. A pregnant woman came to his doorstep, three, nine months pregnant, and there was no place for her. Well, sure there was, but he didn't want to take the time. So he just pushed her away. He goes down in the Bible as a man that was preoccupied, didn't have time. And then we look at the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sanhedrins. They thought they knew everything. They were prideful, sometimes like we are. They wouldn't go two miles to check it out. They were that confident that they were right and everyone else is wrong. They wouldn't check it out. And they knew about the star, and they knew about the king coming, but they wouldn't check it out. That's pretty tragic. And because of that, the whole city because they put their faith in these shepherds, they went to bed that night, and they missed the whole thing about Christmas. And we realized that a whole city went to sleep. And the wise men were two years late. I have a theory on that. They got lost, and they wouldn't ask for help. I think if the women asked, they would have been there the second day. But these guys, they wouldn't ask help. And so finally... They come when there's a house. You know, he's inside the house. And that kind of blows the whole nativity scene because Jesus is not in that nativity scene when the wise men come. He's in the house. So he's up two years old. So we find crazy things going on. But here's the real issue. If the, wise, if the shepherds had not come, no one would have come to that incredible birth. And so a city was too busy. 
People inside were too busy, and we are too busy, no doubt, because the mall is so important. The manger is not that important in our life. If it was, we keep the priority right. We would keep that priority right no matter what would take place in our life. And so he tells us here that God broke into the silence. He broke in, brought light. And he passed by Judea. He passed by Jerusalem. He went by the temple and he went to a city called Nazareth. And Nazareth was only about uh, a few miles away. It had about 15,000 people. It was a really wicked city. It had Romans and Greek. And that's where Jesus was born. Isn't that amazing? He went among the people that did not want him. In fact, the Bible says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that's where he chose to live. And Nathan said, can anything come out of that? And so we realize so often that's the truth. So in Titus, in chapter 3, verse 3, is where we kind of take the whole study. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, and uh, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. What a verse. But, here's the key, but the conjunction when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appeared. And there's the whole story right there. And so the title of this whole series is When Love Appeared. Here it comes, hating one another, yet when the Savior came towards man appeared. Not the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing and the regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become uh, heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, these verses are incredible, but verse 4 is the key. But when the kindness of the love of God, our Savior, appear towards all men. Then in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, I want to read down to verse 31. You turn with me in your Bibles there. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city called Galilee, named Nazareth. So Nazareth was tucked under Galilee, kind of like South Bay and Gardena here to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, a virgin name was Mary. So they had not been legally married. They were married but not legally married. In the Jewish culture, you would be married, but you wouldn't have any sexual relationships for one year. At the end of that, then you would. So the kind of a, the only way to get out of it is by a divorce. So a very different way. And here it goes on to say, verse 28, The angel came in unto her and said, Hell, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now, can you imagine God waking you up, telling you that? Hi, how are you doing? You are highly favored, and the Lord is with you, and you are one blessed woman. Yeah, just look at me. I don't feel very blessed. No makeup, no nothing. Look at me. God, I haven't brushed my teeth. You've got to be kidding me. Then in verse 30, he goes on to say, The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Now check it out. Verse 28, The angel came in, you have found favor. Verse 29, When she saw him, she was troubled, all his sayings, and cast in her mind, What manner of salutation is this? The angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God twice. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now i got to tell you, honestly, as men, if I had to hear my wife tell me, Honey, I'm pregnant. Well, first of all, I know that it didn't happen by me. Now, it could be a miracle, and I realize that. So I'd be waiting for that word. Hey, we had a miracle. Okay, great. But if she would say to me, Oh, it's not yours. <laughs> what? Okay, we've been married 40 years now. If it's not mine, then whose is it? And then she'd tell me this thing about God. Hey, what's his middle name? You know, <laughs> you know I just, it's just so hard to believe. And so Joseph lost it. He was going to divorce her until an angel said, it is from God. And then he believed. So it is a very unique thing, but the reason why, it had to be from God because you remember Adam and Eve sinned and the blood came through Adam and the sin came through Adam. So the only way they could make a righteous person is that God had to implant her because the blood would not be defiled. It's heaven's blood in that 
semen. And so here Jesus Christ is born. God in Christ in the world, reconciling the world to himself. So a very incredible thing. But here a 14-year-old girl is listening, talking, ministering, sharing. She's not wigged out. She's not freaking out. She's not trying to hide anything. She had lived her life before God. And God said, you have been favored twice. And we want to do something. We need your body. We want to bring God into this world. And she said, be it done to my body. You do what you want. Unbelievable story. So we're going to take a look at this in a very profound way. And I think it's going to change our lives. And that's what God does. He takes simple people like this handmaiden, an ordinary teenager, and uses them in an extraordinary way. She would now carry Jesus for nine months. And then Christ would begin to carry her for the rest of her life. And that is the real key for me this year. Am I carrying Christ? And when a woman's pregnant, she has the baby. She's carrying that child. And every place she goes, that child's there. And that's the thing I want to get through your mind. God gave her the position, the privilege to carry the Son of God. And then for the next couple of years, she was able to breastfeed. And then she was able to watch him grow and help him till he was 30 years old. In other words, what a relationship. But then from that point on, he was now going to carry her. And so I want to get to the point for my life, I learned to carry Christ into the store, into the market. If I can't go into some place, I don't want to go. In other words, I need to mentally, in my heart, in my life, know that I have Jesus Christ all over my life. And so if it's even a thing of question, I'm not going to do it. And that's a good thing to think about. And so it says here, simply, the handmaiden of the Lord and a very special priest, Zechariah. He was old. And then a very seasoned old man, you remember Simeon. He said, I want to see him at the very end of my life. And he was now going to dedicate him. And then that great gal, Anna, who was a widow, 80 years old. And then speaking of Mary, Mary knew the angel had spoken. It says it very clear. She knew the angel was there. But it's interesting, Joseph also knew the angel had spoken. And Elizabeth, she knew Christ had came into her home because when Mary came, the baby leaped and she was full of the Holy Ghost. And then we find Zechariah knew that God made his mouth dumb. So you have people who have great knowledge. They know this thing is real. So the question is that today, do I really believe in Christmas? Do I really believe in the Son of God? Do I believe he came to take away my sins, to be the Lord of my life, to take the rulership of my life? And if it's true, then it's going to change the way I think. So three things I want to talk to you about this morning. Number one, Mary was surprised. Mary was surprised. And we see in verse 27, she was chosen by God. And you might think that's interesting. I think every one of you have been chosen. It says that before the foundations of the earth, God chose you. He hand wrote you. He carved you in the palms of his right hand. He foreknew you, and he put his, your name in his book. God has always loved you, always knew he was going to have you, and he has a purpose and a plan for your life. And so we see in verse 27, to the virgin espoused to a man where, whose name was Joseph of the house of David, a virgin named Mary. So she was chosen by God because she was a very, very unique woman. She was not high strung. She was not over the top. She was very common. And 12 year, 14 years old, I mean, that's incredible to me. Now, would you trust your life to a teenager? I don't think so. Would you trust the kingdom of God to a teenager? Well, he did. So I think it's time to really ask God to give us a little bit more trust and to really start understanding. But number two, not only was she chosen by God, but she was favored by God. Verse 28, it says, The angel came into her and said, Thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed thou art among women. And so sometimes you don't feel favored. Sometimes you don't feel very special where you are. When you are chosen by God, you are very special to God. So when you say things like, God, you don't care. You don't know what you're talking about. You're never around. That rips the heart of God and grieves the Holy Spirit because it's not true. Those are words from the pit of hell. God made you. God made you a certain way. God made you think a certain way. And God wants you to think that way. And God made you the way you are because it's going to fit the plan he wants in your life. So you might be somebody that is just real gifted in this area. God will do that. But you have to surrender. Everything you have to fulfill that will in your heart. But you're favored. Well, I don't feel favored. That doesn't make a difference. 
If God called you, God came and died for your sins, and God rose from the dead, and he's coming back, I think that's a pretty favorite thing. No one else is doing that for you. No one else is coming for you. No one else is being resurrected from the dead. No one else cares about you. And by the way, he did all that when you were in sin. So usually we reject people, but here's a God that comes after us and understands, no, from the very foundation of the earth, I wanted Steve Mays. I knew exactly what he's going to go through, and I want him right here in this pulpit, right here doing this work, because I know that in the very last days he will speak the truth. But I'm going to have to work in his heart for a long time Well, he has. And then number three, she was comforted in verse 29 and 30. It says, then she saw him, and she was troubled. Not para- paranoid, but just troubled. I mean, uh, kind of interesting. At the saying, you're kidding me. I'm going to get pregnant. Okay. And her mind was, had all kinds of things going on. And the angel said to her, fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Again, second favor. Don't worry about it. It's gone. So the comfort didn't come by explaining everything. It came by, listen, it's from God. This is the word of God. You're going to be fine. This is what God's doing in your life. You were nothing, but now you're everything. You were ordinary, now you're extraordinary. You were just a teenager, now you will be the greatest woman born among men. In other words, this is the moment that God had been waiting. But it's going to be God. It's not going to be you. It's going to take God working in and through your life. Well, I just feel like a girl. You are a girl. And I chose you because I knew that you would be able to handle it. And then in verse 31, she was able to be used. So it makes sense. I'm chosen by God. I'm favored by God. God comforts my heart. Now he can use me. Notice this. In verse 31, behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now, for a 14-year-old girl, you're going to get pregnant by God. <laughs> okay, no problem. I mean, tremendous faith. I don't care how you look at it. And then, look at she was blessed. It says in verse 32 and 33, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever. His kingdom shall be with no end. And so in verse 32, he's going to be great. And in verse 32, he's going to be Son of the Highest. In verse 32, he's going to be of David. And then, verse 33, two things. He's going to reign over the house of Jacob, and his kingdom will have no end. This is what you have inside of you, almost. (laughs) Mary, at 14, just listened. She pondered these things. She didn't get weird. She didn't get overwhelmed, like, give me an aspirin, I got a headache. I mean, she didn't go crazy. She didn't go run and tell mom and dad. This is a woman that was called. And when you've been chosen by God, And sometimes women feel like they're so not appreciative. Listen, your husbands might not appreciate you, but God chose you. And maybe God chose you for that guy. Through your love and that compassion, he's going to come to Christ. So hang in there. But your love is going to come from God. And so number one, he wants to surprise you. Well, that's a big surprise. Well, what about this? You go to work and they make you a foreman. Wow, I wasn't ready for that. What about this? You go to work and they make you a CEO. Wasn't ready for that. What about this? You go to church, they make you the pastor. Wasn't ready for that. What about this? You win the lottery. I was was ready for that. And then you hear God saying, give it all to the church. I'm not ready for that. He'll surprise you. And all of a sudden, what are you going to do with it? Number two, Mary was surrendered. It's one thing to be surprised. But the reason why is because now you have to do something. You have to surrender. And check it out, verse 34 through 45. She received his word. This is so important. It says, the angel said, in verse 35, said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Also the holy thing which will be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And then in verse 38, Mary said, behold, this is such a great verse, the handmaiden of the Lord, be it done according to thy word. Underline that. You do what you want according to your word. Have you come to that point? Well, no, I've been surprised and God's alive and God's called me, but now God's telling me to do this. I don't want to do it. See, that's the problem. It's one thing to be surprised, but the next thing, if I'm going to surrender, I have to do what he tells me to do. God wants you to ask forgiveness. I'm not going to do that. Then you're not going to receive from God. Well, God wants me to give. I'm not going to do it. Then you're not going to receive from God. In other words, if I am surprised, it's because God is awakening my spirit to something great. But then I must surrender to what he's going to tell me. Sometimes we pray, God, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do that? Thanks. Bye-bye. 
Well, I don't hang around because I know the answer. No. And that's why we don't ask God, can I marry this guy? I'm not going to ask you that because you're going to say no. So why should I give you my boyfriend? Do you realize how crazy that is? When you get married and that guy goes on drugs, you're going to wish to God you would have asked God what he thought. He would have told you. But you didn't because you thought you knew. Don't do that. Let things happen. She received his word. But also, notice in verse 41, very powerfully, she yielded to his spirit. She received the word. Second, she yielded to the spirit. It came to pass that with Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the spirit of God, or the Holy Ghost. Boom, the Holy Spirit took over and was baptizing that child. And she knew this child was special. And then number three, verse 38, three things happened very powerfully. She humbled herself, and these are so cool. In verse 38, she gave up her body. Mary said, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, verse 38, be it unto me according to thy word. Now, I think this is where Christianity meets the road. Because this is where you have to make a decision. Now, I love the Lord, want to do what God wants, but when it comes to my body, it's my body. I can do what I want. I don't have to ask God's permission. Well, this is where victory lies right here. If you give your body to God, give your eyes to God, give your ears to God, you yield your members as into righteousness, then I agree, you're going to have a great walk. But if you choose to use your mind to fill it with junk and clutter and all kinds of crazy things, you are going to destroy the very things that God wants to do. So we come to God, we love God, we serve God, but we never give God our bodies. So our bodies really become the great instrument of Satan in our life. I don't have to do it, don't have to give, don't have to tithe, don't have to go anywhere. You're right, you don't. But I'm not obedient to God. Or I say it this way, I don't want to marry a guy like that. I want a guy that has hair. I don't want a bald head guy. I'm too young. Well, let me ask you this question. Would you rather have a bald headed guy faithful or a guy with long hair unfaithful? You need to answer me that. Put a wig on his head, gals. But get the heart. Well, I'd rather have two eyes than one. Oh, really? Would you rather have a guy leave you when you come down with cancer or stay with you all the way to the very end, even though you can't have a relationship? I'll take the guy with one eye. You take the thing that God gives you. You don't begin to say this or that. You don't look for wholeness. You look for wholeness in God, and God will give you the very thing you need. And no doubt God's going to help you. God's not going to give you something you don't want. He's not going to send you to Africa if you don't like bugs. You have to love bugs to go to Africa. He doesn't take people like, you don't want to go to Africa? I'm sending you to Africa. You're going to fight the mosquitoes and everything else. God doesn't do that. He puts the desire in your heart to want to do that. Those of you that love bugs and eat bugs, you go to Africa. The rest of us will just watch you. You know, that's fine. It's no biggie. But here, number one, she gave her body. You do what you want. That means that her body now is out of commission. No relationship with Joseph. She's going to be shamed for the rest of her life. She's going to be embarrassed for the rest of her life. Joseph is going to have to suffer because the child was not his. In other words, it was going to be a horrible moment, but she didn't care. Do with it what you want. I give you my body, number one. Number two, it says here in verse 46, she gave God her soul. Look at verse 46. Mary said, my soul does magnify the Lord. What does that mean? My mind, my emotion, and my will. Now sometimes you can be a Christian, but my emotions are all over the place. I'm angry. I'm yelling. I'm screaming. I'm throwing things. Now wait a second. Is that the love of God? Well, not really. And then you quote that scripture. Well, Jesus did it. <laughs> You're in danger of dying right now. You know, It was a righteous anger he had. He didn't put people down. But does God have your mind? Is it being transformed? Does God have your emotions, love and joy and peace? Does God have your will? Not my will, but thy will be done. She said, God, not only take my body, but I'll give you my soul. I'll give you the way I think, what I see, how I feel. I'll give you everything I want to do right now. And then number three, I'll give you my spirit. Verse 47. It says here, my spirit has rejoiced in the God of my Savior. This is a great verse. But it's interesting to me, I give you my body. And I think it starts there. I want to give God my spirit and my soul, but I want my body to kind of satisfy it. I want my body to kind of keep it on the hidden ground. My body is kind of locked up in this little thing. I get to do what I want to do with it. No, you don't. If your body is surrendered to God, the spirit and everything else is going to come right behind it. The hardest thing for you to do is for you to say to God, here's my body, take it. Not whine about it, not talk about it. Say, God, here's my body, help me. 
God, you help me not to go into sin with it. God, you help me not to do that. I yield my body to you. And then third, it says Mary was singing in verse 46. In other words, it's time to magnify the Lord. Verse 46. It says, Mary said, my soul does magnify. Isn't that cool? Magnify. Not the problem. Not the situation. Not all the problems in marriage. Not my husband. Not my wife. Not the kids. We're going to magnify the Lord. We're going to talk about Him. Do we have problems? Yes. But we don't magnify those. And then we're going to rejoice in verse 47. My spirit has rejoiced in the God. So I'm going to magnify God. I'm going to rejoice in the God of my salvation. And then I'm going to bless God, verse 48. He says, for he has regarded the law, uh, he has regarded uh, the low esteemed of the handmaiden. Behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty, verse 49, for he that is mighty has done to me great things. Can you say that today? God, you've done great things in my life. Well, I don't think he has. Well, yes, he has. Are you alive? Uh-huh. Are you still here? Yep. Is your Mary still together? Yep. Well, I don't know. No. Is she dead yet? No. Then she's still alive. As long as there's breath, there's hope. God can do anything. And for he that is mighty has done to me great things. Holy is his name. And then in verse 50 through 56, it's once again time to be thankful. And what about, notice what Mary's thankful, verse 50. His mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. I want to thank God for your mercy that you chose me. In spite of me, you chose me, God. And then in verse 51 and 52, she's going to thank God for the strength. He has shown the strength with his army. He has silenced the proud and the imagination of their heart. He has put down the mighty from their seat and exalted them in low degree. In other words, God, you have destroyed the enemy. Through my body, Jesus is coming back into the world. This is great. And then in verse 53, the compassion once again. It says here, He has filled the hungry and the good things and the rich He has sent away empty. And God, you're so good. You sent the rich away, but you've taken care of your people all the time. And then for His faithfulness in verse 54, He has helped his servant Israel, in remembering his mercy. Check it out, verse 55. As he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, to his seed forever. What is God doing? He said one day there's going to be a Messiah coming. That's what's happening. And God kept his word. You're kidding me. No. For 120 years, Noah built an ark. And then he floated in that thing for over a year. And then the Bible says, and God remembered Noah. That's a great verse in the Bible. Thank God he remembered Noah. Sometimes you lose your key. Where do you hide? I don't know. I hid it so I wouldn't lose it. <laughs> and then lastly, for his praise, it says here in verse 56, Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. And when I look at this whole thing, I begin to realize, God, this is what I want in my life. This is what I want for Christmas. I want you to surprise me. But I don't want that hypocritical mind, like, you know, Who's going to take advantage of me? What are you going to do? You know, always negative, always paranoid. God, would you surprise me? Well, you're going to make me go to Africa. No, God, would you surprise me? God, you know where I'm at. It's not good. God, would you take me up for no other reason because of your goodness? I'll do that. Lord, would you surprise me? He did. Kids are coming back. Things are happening here. You know, we've got the permits. God can't believe it. We got surprise, you know. Unbelievable. But what about you? No surprise is my house for 20 years. You know, we've been here 20 years, and it's like, it's dead. Oh, really? When's the last time you've been surprised? I've been waiting for him for 20 years. What about God? Has God surprised you? I don't know. Well, you know, you can bypass your husband and see God, and God can so fill your heart that you're happy and joyful. And then I realize Oh, God, not only do that for me, but once again, would you help me surrender? I want to give you my body. I want to give you my spirit. I want to give you my soul. And lastly, I want to be thankful. Fourteen years old, God said, I found a child that I can bring myself through. This is the woman of all women. I'll use her. Let me end by reading this to you. God, this is maybe Mary's prayer before she tucked in Jesus. God of infant God, heaven's fairest child, 
conceived by union and divine grace with this grace, sleep well, sleep well, bask in the coolness of the night brightness with diamonds, sleep well, for the heat of anger simmers nearby, enjoy the silence of the crib, for the noise of confusion rumbles in your future. Savior, the sweet safety of my arms, for a day is soon coming when I cannot protect you anymore. Rest while thy hands, thy tiny hands, for though you belong to a king, you will never touch any satin. Own no gold, you will grasp no pin, guide no brush, no your tiny hands are reserved for the work more precious, to touch the leopard's open wounds, to wipe away the widow's weary tears, to clod the ground of Gethsemane. Your hands, so tiny, so tender, so soft, clutched tonight as infants do. They are not destined to hold the scepter, nor were they in the palace or the balconies. They are reserved instead for a Roman spike and will staple them to the Roman's cross. Sleep deep, thy eyes sleep while you can, for soon the blurry will be away. The blurriness will come, be clear, and you will see the mess we made our world. You will see the nakedness. You cannot, we cannot hide it from you any longer. You will see our selfishness, for you cannot help us. You will see our pain, for we cannot be healed. Our eyes that will see hell's deepest pit and witness the ugliest princess. Sleep, prince, sleep. One day you will. Lay still, tiny mouth. Lay still, mouth, for eternity speaks through. Thy tongue that will soon summons the dead and will define grace, that will silence our foolishness. Rosebud lips upon which the ride of star birth kisses of forgiveness to those who believe you and the death to those who deny you. And tiny feet coupled in the palms of my hands rest for many difficult steps lie ahead for you. Do you taste the dust of the trail you will travel? Do you feel the cold sea waters upon which you will walk? Do you wrench at the invasion of the nails which will go through your feet? Do you fear the steps of descent down the spiral case to Satan's dominion? Rest, tiny feet, rest today. Tomorrow you might walk with power, for millions will follow your steps. And little heart, holy heart, pumping the blood of life through the universe, how many times will we break you? You'll be torn by the thorns of our accusation. You'll be ravaged by the cancer of our sin. You'll be crushed under the weight of our sorrow, and you'll be pierced by the sword of our rejection. Yet in the piercing, in the ultimate ripping of the muscles and membrane, in that final rush of blood and water, you will find rest. Your hands will be free. Your eyes will see justice. Your lips will smile. Your feet will carry you home. And there your rest again till time and embraces your Father. Father, I pray that God that you would teach us that God, this child that was born and a son that is given, that you would remind us that someone had to take care of him in the early days of their life. And Lord, what an awesome responsibility to be able to hold the oracles of God and teach in such a way that God, that you want us in ministry to love it in such a way that we hold it true to our hearts. And then God, we realize that in each of our lives we were married for one reason, because we loved each other and how we've let that slip. We have fallen away from you and each other. And God, sometimes we're so impatient that we want to help the marriage along and ourselves. We want to get married and we rush ahead and find ourselves in sin. God, today, I pray more than any other day that this Christmas, God, you would surprise us with your presence. And that God, that you would so teach us to surrender to your authority in love. And that, God, we would find ourselves singing for the first time of our life. Maybe while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed today, you would say, Pastor Steve, would you pray that I might come back to Jesus Christ? I need to get right with him. I believe Jesus Christ is coming. I believe that this is a message I can embrace. I want to come back to this type of a love. Or maybe you've never asked Christ into your heart. And this is the day you're going to do it. Boy, while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you want me to pray for you, would you simply raise your hand high? 
Raise them high that I might see them. Pray for you. God bless you and God bless you and God bless you and God bless you. God bless you and God bless you. God bless you here. God bless you three in the very back row. God bless you over there. God bless you three, four over here. God bless you two over there. Anybody else before we close? Don't be embarrassed. God bless you two right over here. I see them. God bless you. What a great day. A day that the Son of God is going to be inside you and you'll carry him for the rest of your life. God bless you and God bless you. Father, I thank you for these wonderful hands. Now, God, make this Christmas great. Take the sorrow, take the pain. Take all the sadness away. We are instruments of the most holy God, and we are called to minister. And this is a moment where we die to ourselves, and we become a blessing to everybody else. In Jesus' name, amen.